there are two factors of the path that go very closely together, right resolve and right concentration. In fact, the relationship is so close that there's a sutta where the Buddha says mundane right resolve is resolving on renunciation, on non-ill will, and on harmlessness. And noble right resolve is actually the equivalent of the first jhana. And in the different accounts of how the Buddha got in the path, sometimes he says he started with right resolve, and sometimes he says he started with right concentration. So the two are very close. When the Buddha talks about how he moved from right resolve to right concentration in his own path, he starts out by talking how he made a value judgment about his thinking. He stepped back from his thoughts and basically asked himself two questions. Where do they come from? Where do they go? This is based on the realization of right view, that your actions have consequences. They come out of the mind. So you have to look into your thoughts to see what kind of actions those thoughts are, what kind of consequences they'll have, whether they're worth thinking or not. It's a value judgment. Because as I said, not only do they lead you to specific actions, but if you keep thinking about certain kinds of thoughts that bends your mind in a particular direction, it's like putting a rut in your mind. And every time you go over that particular road, you fall into the rut. So he thought. <coughs> so he thought. Saw that thoughts that were based on. Excuse me. He saw that thoughts based on sensuality, ill will, and harmfulness would bend the mind in the wrong direction. Whereas thoughts based on renunciation of sensuality, non-ill will, i.e., goodwill harmlessness or compassion, those would bend the mind in a good direction. The first ones were not even worth the effort to think. So whatever effort went into stopping them, that was effort that was well used. He compared himself to a cowherd during the rainy season. That's the time when the rice is growing, and if the cows get into the rice, they're going to be trouble. They'll be dragged to court by the owners of the rice. So he has to check the cows and beat them and make sure they get afraid of the rice. But as for thoughts that were imbued with renunciation, non-ill-will, harmlessness, he said that was like being a cowherd during the dry season. The rice had been kept. That's a, gosh, that was tithe. a tithe statement. The rice had been harvested and put away. And so there's no danger for the cows. They could walk, wander anywhere, pretty much. So the cowherd could just sit under a tree, and all I had to remember that the cows were over there someplace. It's the same with skillful thoughts. You see, it's okay to think them. It's worth the effort. Although the Buddha realized that if you think even skillful thoughts all the time, it's going to be tiring for the mind. That's when he decided to bring his mind into concentration. So that's how you go from mundane right resolve to noble right resolve. Seeing the concentration is a better place to be. It's a better investment of your energy. Here again, it's a value judgment. The entire path, as you're developing your right view through practicing the path, you're getting more and more refined in your judgments as to what's worth doing, what's not worth doing, and specifically what's worth doing in terms of what's worth thinking. This means we have to step back from our thoughts. Concentration gives us a good place to step back, and it's kind of a back-and-forth process. On the one hand, you have to appreciate the concentration, the rest that it offers you, and see that it's better than the thinking. 
but you're not going to see that until your concentration gets good. And your concentration is not going to get good until you see its value. So it, it sounds like a double bind, but it's actually a, pointing out that it's going to be a complex process. You get some concentration, you learn some lessons. Then you forget them. Well, then you get concentration again. You try to learn those lessons again. And after all, the lessons begin to take, and then they begin to grow. Which is why you shouldn't get frustrated with the ups and downs of the practice. They're expected. The texts don't lay things out in terms of ups and downs. Everything is very orderly, neatly laid out. If you go from step A to step B to step C, and there's hardly any talk about regression. But when you actually look at the stories of the monks and the nuns, that they tell in the Tarigata and Tarigata, there's lots of back and forth. Because right resolve depends on right concentration, and right concentration depends on right resolve. The two go together. To understand whether your thoughts are worth thinking or not, you have to step back from them. And you have to apply it a good standard of judgment. This is what the whole path is all about, is developing your standards of judgment. It starts with generosity. It's worthwhile giving. And John Lee has a nice image. He says, when you give something, it's like squeezing the juice out of a fruit. You give the rind to the other person, and you keep the juice. When you can see generosity in that way, it becomes a lot easier to be generous. It changes your ideas about how important it is to own things, or how important it is to develop qualities of mind. The same with virtue. There are lots of things you can gain by breaking the precepts, but there comes a point when you realize they're not, not, they're not worth it. It's better to have the precept than to have the money, say, that can come from lying or stealing, cheating. And you begin to see things in terms of cause and effect, actions and the results that you're you gain from those actions. And developing your powers of judgment outside, then you can start applying them inside the mind. And what you carry in from generosity and virtue is the realization that you have learned to enjoy abandoning unskillful qualities and developing skillful ones. That's puts you in line with what are called the customs of the noble ones. There are four altogether. The first three have to do with contentment. In other words, realizing in terms of material surroundings, you don't need that much. Food, clothing, shelter. Your basic needs are pretty few, and anything beyond that is excess. The purpose of this is so that your values are not the materialistic ones that the world encourages. And to change your values over to delighting in abandoning unskillful qualities and delighting in developing skillful ones. Now here you run up against some pretty deeply entrenched habits of the mind, the, the way the mind has been bent in the past. We enjoy our anger, usually. We enjoy our lust. We enjoy our desires. Sometimes we even enjoy our fear, our jealousy, our desire for revenge. And so we have to see that these things have some pretty strong bad consequences. Again, thinking in terms of the teachings on karma. And the best way to see that, of course, is to not only keep thinking about the principle of karma, but actually to try to develop some space for concentration in the mind, and some confidence that you can do it. One of the qualities is of the second jhana is assurance. In the beginning, you have to have the confidence, yes, you can do this. And as you begin to focus in on your object, and you adjust it here, and you adjust it there, and is it quite right? Yeah, well, no, it's not quite right. Well, keep adjusting. There's always a bit of doubt and a bit of uncertainty in the direct of thought and evaluation. And finally, you decide, okay, I want to 
settle in. And you hold on. And in the beginning, it's like holding on to a ship that's being pulled through the, the ocean really fast. And it's just holding on by your fingernails. And there's a little bit of fear that you could fall off at any time, but then you begin to realize you have a stronger and stronger and stronger hold. And you can do it. And then when you've got that sense of pleasure inside, then you can look at the allure of the things that would pull you away. And then you can look at the drawbacks. And you're looking from a much fairer or much more objective point of view. But still, you're engaging in right resolve, looking at your thoughts and seeing where do they come from, where do they go. Instead of asking yourself how much you enjoy that particular thought, how much that thought is really your thought, the kind of thought you would think, where you're affirming your identity, or whatever else, whatever other pleasure you may get out of certain kinds of unskillful thinking. You step back and say, I don't know if I want to go there. And you have to realize it's good to have that choice. It's good to have that option to step back. That when you step back from your anger, you're not becoming a person of niceness who can get stepped all over. Actually, you're putting yourself in a stronger position. If you show your anger, people know how to get to you. Sometimes we think, well, I have to be a nice person. So I shouldn't show my anger. But the Buddha's not saying you get past your anger for the sake of niceness. Strategically, it's a better position to be in. At the very, very least, don't show your anger. Then no one can know when they got to you. I've been reading about the feud between Voltaire and Rousseau. And Rousseau kept opening himself up, and Voltaire was vicious in trying to find out Rousseau's weak spots, and, Voltaire, and Rousseau just kept opening them up. So that was a case where Rousseau would have been a lot better if he hadn't shown his anger. Voltaire wouldn't have known where to hit him. So don't think of overcoming your anger as a kind of weakness. It is a victory, as the Buddha said. One of those victories that the Buddha said, better than victory over a thousand other people is victory over yourself. And that includes victory over your anger. So learn how to see that, that change the perception in your mind that sees anger as a strength. And see it as a weakness. When you don't show your anger to other people, they don't know how to get to you. Think of it in that way. So go through all the various perceptions that give some allure to your anger or allure to your lust. For some reason, we seem to think that when we're feeling lust, we become attractive. But when you look at other people, you realize how ridiculous it is. This is where it's good to look at other people's thinking as they show it, their emotions as they show them, and see it's pretty ridiculous. And then you turn around and say, well, I've got the same stuff in myself. That's what the Buddha is talking about when he says you have mindfulness or of, say, mind states both inside and outside. You look at the mind states that other people are showing, and you say, whoops, I've got that too. I've got to work on that. This enables you to step back from your thoughts, both through concentration and through discernment. In every case, it's a value judgment. Insight is always a judgment call. And the practice is designed to improve your values, improve your sense of judgment. So you can finally judge where it is you're causing yourself unnecessary suffering and why it's better to stop. That's the best judgment call of all.